I think we'll wait a few more minutes uh, before we get started. I see people still signing on here, and I know Kelly, you are getting ready for your presentation, uh, but we'll wait a, maybe a minute more to have more join. Perfect, thanks Christy. I was just gonna say the same thing, um, but while Kelly's adjusting the background lighting, um, I just wanna say welcome to everybody who's already um, joined the Zoom meeting and, and hopefully we'll have a few more joining in. I'm looking forward to doing uh, to seeing all the resident presentations at Grand Rounds this year. Plus, we do have a few guest speakers set up. Um, Zoom again, we're continuing on with that at least until the new year. And we're just going to play things as they go. And uh, Kelly, if you can, as we did last year, although you weren't part of Grand Rounds last year, but um, leave a few minutes at the end, maybe 10 to 15 minutes at the end for some uh, good discussion around the topics and, and points that you bring up today. That would be fantastic. But otherwise, I think we're we're pretty most close to nine o'clock. And in order to make sure we're we're done on time, I think we'll uh, get started. If you're ready, Kelly. Maybe Christine. Before uh, we do that, Wanda and I just need about two minutes just to yeah, introduce absolutely. a couple of items. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So thank you, Christine, and thank you, Gory, for another exciting year, another exciting academic year for Grand Round. Uh, welcome, everyone, and welcome to the returning residents and to all the incoming residents. I know as you uh, start your academic year this year, it will certainly be an ongoing interesting year. I appreciate everyone being flexible and nimble. You know, certainly we didn't anticipate COVID impacting us the way it has, and we will continue to see the impact of COVID over the next 12 months. And as Christine has said, all as much teaching as possible and all meetings and grand rounds will be done online until further notice. Uh, we're all becoming experts certainly in remote learning. As we start the academic year, um, a lot of things are happening worldwide with equity and racism. And I wanna make everyone aware that we are in tune with that here and working on our own equity discussions and how to include equity and diversity within our own academic environment. Wanda Millard and Rod Lim are spearheading the work. Wanda, as all of you know, is one of our excellent emergency physicians and sports medicine physicians and is also the provider value officer for our group. So I wonder if you want to take a couple of minutes just to introduce a couple of items and then we'll hand it over to Kelly for grand rounds. So again, welcome everyone. Thank you, Christy, and let me echo your welcome to everybody. Welcome back to the academic year. Um, I'm post night, so I wrote down what I wanted to say just so it came across coherently. And for that same reason, I won't be able to stay and and listen to, I'm sure, what will be your excellent grand runs, Kelly. So as a provider officer responsible for mentoring and wellness in our physician group, I also collaborate with both directorships of the programs to, on the topics of resident wellness. We are actively involved in ensuring we are progressive in providing a learning and working environment sensitive to equity and encouraging diversity. The FR program developed a mission, vision, and values statement led by Dr. Chantal Forrestal, and the same statements have been adopted by the CC, CCFPEM program this year. To highlight, the mission statement states, foster the development of leaders in emergency medicine who strive to be clinically excellent, promote inclusivity, and value wellness. We, as the Division of Emergency Medicine, are committed to providing a safe and equitable learning environment for our residents. And if you see something that just doesn't seem right, or is missing, or is working really well, please reach out to us, or your chiefs, or your program directors, so that we, we may continue the work in progress to ensure that EM London is a desirable place to work and to learn for everyone. Thank you. Great, thanks very much, Wanda. Kelly, over to you. We're looking forward to your grand rounds. And thank you for being the first resident of the year to present. All right, um, can you hear me? I just unmuted myself. I hope that's a yes. We yes. hear you. You're good. All right, okay. I'm just gonna try to show my screen. Let me just see if I can get that working properly. 
OK, is everyone sort of seeing my slides up there now? Yeah, we can see the slides. OK, perfect. Um, so uh, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, I uh, wanted to just introduce my Grand Rounds talk. Um, I, everyone sort of last year seemed to have some kind of catchy title, so I tried to make up my own as well. Um, and my supervisor for this talk is uh, Dr. Kamani. Uh, just to sort of start with my objectives. So my first, you can sort of read them there. We're going to just do a brief overview of sort of ondogenic infections and the role of antibiotics. Um, and then moving on to sort of uh, discussing penicillins and cephalosporins. And then talking about a new decision-making tool, actually, that I recently heard about, uh, and some of you guys might have heard about on MRAP as well, um, to sort of help us decide whether or not we think it's actually um, OK to use penicillins in people who have penicillin allergies, or at least say that they do. Um, this sort of just idea came up from me seeing lots of patients in the eMERGE with dental issues. And now, especially with COVID, um, I feel like we'll probably end up seeing a lot more of them just because people are scared to go to their dentist's office, even though they are open now. And um, basically also just staff uh, talking about, you know, still prescribing amoxicillin or that sort of thing when people say they have a penicillin allergy because no one believes that their allergy is a true one. I thought it was a good idea to sort of just look into the literature and see what, um, what actually has been said about the topic. And then just a quick acknowledgement slide. I had multiple people sort of have their input into this presentation. Uh, I really want to thank Jeff um, the most, I guess. He's one of the OMF Fest residents who was able to help me out with the dental section of this talk. Um, and then uh, Dr. Ren, who is also an ID fellow uh, at U of T, who helped me out as well, and the other three staff from Western below there. All right, so just moving on to the first case. Um, I'm sure you guys have seen this before, but a 32-year-old male in the ED at 2 a.m., because of course that's when they all come in because their dentists are closed. Um, he looks well, normal vitals, no lymphadenopathy, uh, and they're healthy with no medical issues. And then you see in his mouth that you can, this is a beautiful image. I don't know if I could actually be able to see that, but this is the tooth. And then sort of just, in this clinical context, and uh, some food for thought, would you give this person antibiotics or not? And you can sort of think about that, and then think about your answer uh, at the end of this talk and see if it's changed at all. Uh, and then just moving on to sort of basic dental anatomy, for those of us who did not do dental school or did not have a good understanding of dental anatomy prior to this, we don't really get much of it in medical school, I find. And, even as like a family medicine resident, we don't get any teaching on it whatsoever. So um, let me just see if I can get my pointer there working. Yeah, so just a brief anatomy. You start with the enamel at the top, you move on to the dentin and then the pulp. Those are sort of the three layers, I wanna say, that are important to our talk. Uh, you can see that the pulp actually has actual nerve endings and blood vessels running through it. Um, and then it goes into the actual bone. Uh, lower down there. All right, and then just a sort of brief overview of odontogenic uh, infections. Um, so when you read up about this, it's usually divided into two different types, um, just based on anatomically where the actual disease is itself. Um, so you have your dental disease, which is the disease of the actual bone, and then the periodontal, which is actually the disease of the gum. Um, in practice, we sort of worry more about these ones here on the dental disease side and maybe a periodontal abscess. Uh, gingivitis and uh, pericorditis we don't see very much in our practice, or at least we wouldn't be able to differentiate uh, those two very well without a complete thorough dental exam. And then just moving on to sort of the stages of decay in uh, dental infection. So it starts with just a general carry, and that is probably just from um, poor dental hygiene over time, uh, which slowly sort of progresses on and on. Um, I couldn't get a specific time frame of how fast this would progress. Um, it seemed like in the literature that they talked about more uh, host factors and immune factors more than anything else, and uh, like how poor someone's hygiene is as well. Um, I can see lots of our patients, though, especially at Vic, um, tend to come in 
and with, who have actually like, multiple carries at that point in time and come with a lot of pain. So it's important to see if we can sort of catch it early before it progresses. Um, that's more of a preventative healthcare measure, but if we can sort of catch patients at this stage, if they come into the eMERGE, to give them the correct advice about how to stop progression. Um, so you can see as it sort of gets more and more severe that it starts just at the enamel and then moves into the pulp. And so that sort of explains why we start to get pain at the pulpitis and periodontitis stages and not really so much just the dental caries as well. And so this is just a picture of um, sort of the general dental carry that we might see in the eMERGE. You can see that there's significant breakdown of the tooth enamel just right there, um, but you can't actually see any blood vessels or gum under it. Uh, so this sort of presentation would rarely be painful if it hasn't progressed past just the regular dental carry. Uh, and I would say this is commonly what we see in the eMERGE, um, I would say more often than the other more severe disease. And then this I didn't know about so much until I read a little bit more into the literature. So um, sort of actually like two stages of pulpitis, and they're pretty self-explanatory. Um, by the time they get into the emergency department, we usually think of it being irreversible at that point in time because people are usually presenting with pain, and so they're already at this stage, unfortunately. Um, and so this sort of helps us on our physical exam as well. We're always kind of told to tap the tooth and see if that hurts. Um, these people are usually coming in with intense pain that doesn't go away. So I personally don't think I see very many at the reversible stage, and they've already sort of gone to here. Um, but from our sort of physical exam and from what I was talking to with Jeff, uh, it's pretty difficult for eMERGE docs um, who do not have the correct tools in the uh, eMERGE to differentiate between the two, other than by clinically they're in pain. And so this is just a picture of what pulpitis might look like. Um, you can see that here it's actually gone a little bit farther down than just the dental caries that we'd seen on the other side. And you can see uh, just on this representation that it's sort of getting into um, almost the pulp, not yet. Um, but you can see that it's definitely getting towards there, and that's why we might be starting to get some pain. Um, and then the irreversible pulpitis, I think it's starting to now get into the uh, nerve tissue. And then the next slide is something I don't think I've seen yet, although after this talk, I personally am probably going to be looking more closely at people's teeth when I see a, a dental patient in the eMERGE. Um, so these are the, the periapical abscesses, and these are pretty obvious. They look like sort of any other abscess that we would see uh, on a different body part. Um, these also cause pain and swelling, and sometimes you can actually get tooth mobility at this point just because the, the amount of pressure here is sort of pushing up on that. Uh, and these also present as um, percussion sensitive and quite a bit of pain as well. And they're usually at the apex of the tooth, just right here. Uh, and then you can contrast to uh, periodontal abscesses. So I personally probably would find it very difficult to uh, differentiate between the two. And on my next slide, I have a bit better picture for us to take a look. Um, these actually can get quite bad and you can sort of get starting to get uh, systemic symptoms um, and by this point in time they might have mild pain because it's just damaged the nerve just so much that they are not feeling the pain anymore similar to like a, a serious burn um, and this is more exposed after the gum has actually been removed from on top of the abscess and that's what the, uh, the dentists will do to actually get the abscess out um, these are usually treated um, appropriately with systemic antibiotics, um, and we'll sort of talk about uh, the differences between actually needing antibiotics or not later on in this presentation. Um, and usually these are referred to a periodontist for um, like a second stage of treatment. Generally the first stage of treatment would be them to drain uh, by making a sort of lumen just similar to this picture. And then the next stage, which the periodontist will do, would be to actually do a flap surgery and replace the gum on top of it in case they need to. Um, and so this is the slide I was talking about in terms of differentiating between um, a periapical abscess uh, versus periodontal. Um, it 
I think myself, I'd find it pretty difficult to differentiate between them. And so I think that I personally would rely on more um, systemic symptoms once it gets to the periodontal stage, um, because they all sort of look like a small abscess and it's hard to say exactly where it is. Um, as I was saying earlier, the pericoronal uh, dental abscesses, we don't see as much, but it's usually with an impacted tooth and more beside it, less uh, as compared to these ones, which are more directly beneath it. And then the gingival, if you have a really keen eye, you can see that it's actually between the teeth and not actually at the apex of the tooth. Um, any questions about sort of the different types of dental abscesses there so far? All right, so I will move on. Um, so basically, the way you're going to manage this patient in the eMERGE, uh, you might, if you're fancy, do a, uh, a nerve block and give them some analgesia. Uh, with this, their pain is much improved. And then at this point in time, the patient asks you about antibiotic usage and whether or not they should be on antibiotics. And so in my experience, um, having done rotations in other cities as well, it's honestly variable in terms of which staff think it's um, necessary to give antibiotics all the time or if it's more to um, like make the patient happy. Um, I'm just kind of curious to see maybe if some of the staff wanted give their opinion uh, in this sort of case. Would you give any antibiotics so far? Maybe I can con Dr. Bimani into giving his input. <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of times we do end up uh, giving these patients antibiotics, especially if there is um, obvious sort of swelling erythema in the area. Um, I feel like unless they're, you know, drug seekers with chronic dental caries, if they have something acute going on, I tend to uh, lean towards giving antibiotics. I don't know what other staff feel about that and what you'll enlighten us about that, Kelly, but that is the practice in the middle of the night. Helps uh, get rid of the patient as well, so. Um, I'm sure you'll enlighten us differently, but that would be my practice. I don't know if the, any of the other staff want to pitch in quickly. If not, I can uh, move on to the next slide. I'll just give you a few seconds. All right. Well, yeah. So Dr. Mamani basically sort of meant like most of the staff that I've worked with here, um, I would say think similarly to that as well. Um, though I just want to bring up, and uh, obviously this is the whole point of my talk, um, we have started doing, you know, delayed antibiotic prescriptions in acutitis media, um, you know, viral pharyngitis. We've stopped giving antibiotics to and tried to convince patients that they don't need antibiotics. And so um, I'll talk about it a little bit later, but it's just food for thought about you know, it is easier to give the script, not explain why they don't actually need antibiotics and let them go. Um, but there's lots of side effects to that as well, which include the ones listed here. <laughs> um, so just general overview of uh, antibiotic adverse events, we don't always think about because um, I personally will try to list at least the most common side effects if I'm giving a prescription to patients, but I obviously don't list all of them to the patient, and I feel like maybe if we did do that more often, it might actually change their mind about whether or not they need the antibiotics, especially for younger patients. Um, because a lot of them do get nausea vomiting, and sort of on a population level, we are contributing to uh, multi-drug resistant organisms by giving antibiotic prescriptions when they're not necessary. So, um, you know, Q2C prolongation, uh, we don't usually use fluoroquinolones for dental infections, but that is a known side effect as well. So just being a little bit more thoughtful with antibiotic usage in general. And then specifically in dental infections. Um, so unfortunately, I couldn't find a good overview uh, from the Canadian Dental Association, but at least from what I was talking to with Jeff, um, a lot of the literature and guidelines are quite similar. And so the newest thing I could find was this 
publication in 2019, actually, from the actual Dental Association itself, which is a large meta-analysis of the available literature for this, uh, for dental abscesses and antibiotics, but, and there actually isn't quite much in the literature, surprisingly, even for the dentists. Um, so they sort of compared any, any studies that included these disease processes that I mentioned earlier. And their definitions are quite similar to the ones that I sort of explained earlier. So the irreversible papitis uh, with pain spontaneously, can't heal anymore. And then even more specific dental um, subtypes that I didn't go much into because we probably will not be able to differentiate that ourselves. And so basically they did a systematic review and looked for any um, trials that compared these conditions with antibiotics and with placebo or no medications. And they actually were only able to find three, surprisingly, and none of them were recent. Um, so from what I could tell in my discussions with, uh, with Jeff, like there isn't, as I was saying, that much literature about this. And um, I'm surprised uh, that they haven't done more recent trials on it. Um, I guess with the dental association, they can actually just go in and fix the actual problem by removing the tooth or draining the abscess, but, um, and that might be why there are not that many studies about this, because you wouldn't just be giving supportive management if you were a dentist, you'd actually be actively fixing the problem. Um, so basically, they all use penicillin as the antibiotic comparator as well. And so just the summarized table from that study, um, it if you sort of look at the risk ratio of whether or not people have pain um, or swelling after the antibiotics versus uh, no antibiotics, you can actually see that at different time points, weirdly enough, it reverses in that the risk ratio actually gets worse if you have um, like the antibiotics. And so this is obviously a outcome of, you know, only having three trials and the trials were actually quite small as well. So if huge confidence intervals, there's no significant values. Um, and so just from the review of the literature here, there isn't much evidence for it or against it. Um, and the sort of options one and two here are just how they categorize antibiotics versus placebo. It's just the, they had to combine different um, naming subtypes from the three different trials here. But you can see here again, even the intraoral swelling, the improvement isn't great with the antibiotics. And so I want to say overall, this is poor, um, like a poor meta-analysis because the inputted randomized clinical trials are small and not great, but it does still kind of say that there isn't obvious evidence we should be giving antibiotics, I would think. And so their actual conclusion is that um, it suggests, you know, both a benefit and a harm, and there's lots of different side effects uh, of antibiotic usage as well that they mention in the study. And so this sort of just builds on what I was saying earlier about whether or not we should actually be doing antibiotics in this situation. Obviously in real life, you know, as Dr. Romani said, it's much easier to do the antibiotics and maybe it will help them, maybe it won't, but it does get them out of the department, uh, especially, you know, at 2 a.m. And the patients are probably expecting the antibiotics because they're just so used to getting them as well. Um, talking to Jeff, he said it is quite a bit of an issue with dentists over prescribing antibiotics for these infections. Um, and so I think we should all probably do a better job of making this like our new viral pharyngitis in that we don't need to give antibiotics and we should be explaining to patients that we might not need them, or at least doing a delayed prescription. Can I just make a comment, Kelly? Yeah. Um, I think uh, it's really interesting to see these studies. In my mind, it's not necessarily a script to appease the patient, but I think about other factors that could impact morbidity or mortality, such as infective endocarditis, bacteremia, or serious sequelae. So while swelling and pain are um, important outcomes to think of the patient, I would want to see, or at least that are some of the more life-threatening outcomes because um, even dental cleanings can, can cause bacteremia and some serious effects, especially in populations with multiple dental caries um, and those who do use uh, IV drugs. So I think that's an important consideration that I keep in the back of my head. 
Yeah, for sure. I have a, a slide later as well, um, just about what Jeff and I discussed in his recommendations for LHSE patients. And it definitely does touch on what you just said about um, people, you know, who are immunocompromised, um, like people who inject drugs as well. And so he also, and it seems like the dental OMFS, uh, like their program at least has that same thought as you. Um, and so it's just a little bit later on in the slide that I'll talk about it as well. Because there definitely isn't like a correct answer, as you were saying. Okay, great, thanks. Um, and then I just wanted to quickly talk about this uh, study that I found as well, just at, actually based at U of T, where they actually surveyed um, emergency and family physicians um, about these dental infections to see if they would give um, antibiotics or not, which I actually found quite interesting. Um, and they got some other info as well, including, you know, comfort with dental procedures, how many hours of dental talks they actually had in residency as well. Um, and so the pictures that they used in this survey to send to the physicians were the ones that I have here. Um, so this one is the irreversible palpitis. Uh, this is the localized acute abscess without systemic involvement. This one is the same thing, but with systemic involvement. And then this is a chronic um, apical abscess as well. And so according to their, uh, I guess, expert opinion and using the American Dental Association guidelines, the only one that would actually need antibiotics in, you know, if we're going to go with pure scientific, um, you know, accuracy or whatever, it would be only C actually. Um, but that would honestly is not the real life answer for most people. Um, and so what they did is in terms of their results, I have on the next slide here. Um, so in scenario one, it's overall 57% of uh, physicians would actually give that antibiotics. In this scenario, it was 84.8%. And then in scenario three, it was 96.3%. And so, um, you know, it sort of fits what we see clinically. It looks more severe, and so more people are giving it antibiotics. Um, there is no difference between family medicine trained doctors and uh, emergency medicine uh, emergency medicine physicians as well. Um, and it's actually interesting as well, just looking at the other data that they collected, that they actually, for some reason, found that as the, I guess, the severity of the infection increased, at least visibly, um, the rate of non-narcotic um, prescriptions decreased and the narcotic prescriptions increased, which I would find interesting because I think, you know, we should always be trying to use non-narcotic prescriptions as our first line and then move on to these ones if we need to. And so it was interesting to see that the analgesia for the non-narcotics actually decreased over time, which I would think should be either the same rate or increasing. But overall, it basically says that you know, as, as Dr. Ronnie said, and sort of what we're talking about, a lot of people would give these antibiotics, and so I don't think you're not practicing the same as other physicians if you did, because even in scenario one, 57% of people gave antibiotics to it. And so their um, sort of recommended treatment algorithm in the study is probably really similar to what most docs are doing already. Um, so doing, you know, your physical exam, is there actually systemic involvement, and then um, you know, delayed antibiotic prescriptions if possible, and then referral to a dental professional as well. Um, so if they had systemic involvement, they do recommend maybe considering to prescribe an antibiotic. And I think this is what we're doing. And so uh, I think it's reassuring that, um, as I said, we're practicing like other physicians are as well, even in Toronto. Um, and then sort of the antibiotic prescription that they recommend, and from what I was talking to with Dr. El Said as well, is uh, amoxicillin um, first line, and not necessarily amoxiclav, uh, interestingly. Um, and so their dosage that they recommend uh, was the 500 TID. Um, and so I'm not sure what most people had been giving uh, as prescriptions at LHSC, but this is sort of the recommended, and this is what ID here has told me to suggest to everyone as well. And then this uh, penicillin allergy that we'll talk about uh, later on in this presentation as well. So amoxicillin, not necessarily amoxiclav, surprisingly, um, unless it's getting worse, then they recommend adding the clavulinic acid part. And then sort of just choosing wisely overall, they also 
don't suggest antibiotics for these um, situations unless there's systemic involvement as well. And then I just wanted to move on to uh, sort of the expert opinion I was talking about earlier. So these slides are in discussion with Jeff. Um, so just talking to them, they also agree, you know, risk benefit is lacking. Um, it difficult, especially for eMERGE docs to differentiate the cause of pain compared to the dentists who have all the correct tools to use. Um, and then he just mentioned about being the pain being more localized if it's a periapical periodontitis. And the patients are actually maybe more able to tell you which tooth it is specifically, whereas sometimes you might have a patient coming in that says, oh, I just have pain in this general area. Um, if they can localize the tooth, it might be a bit more, um, more severe at that point. And then, so what did he suggest? Um, sort of what, uh, I think it was Dr. Kim sorry, saying earlier, sorry, I don't have my uh, speaker thing up, but, um, you know, we mentioned like immunocompromised, questionable reliability, which I think sort of touched on earlier. Um, and then someone who has a previous swelling at the same site. And their thought is that um, it, they think that the antibiotics might decrease the swelling and then the swelling sort of tied them over until a dentist can see them. And so that was their thinking as to why they would give antibiotics. Um, but his suggestions were sort of these more specifically, you know, your young, healthy 20 year old who can see a dentist tomorrow um, can probably actually go without antibiotics. But obviously, you have to see how um, reliable the patient is. And then they also mentioned that you can always refer to the dental clinic um, at UH and Vic. Um, I didn't actually know that we can refer these general ones to the dental interns. I feel like I've always just been telling people to see their regular dentist. Um, and they actually mentioned that sometimes they can, you know, find a way to have these procedures covered. <laughs> um, I don't know how they can do that, but uh, he did recommend if you find that they might not have a dentist or can't afford it to try referring to them. I think they're a little bit cheaper as well compared to community dentists. And obviously, if you're worried about the patient, you should, um, he said that the OMFS residents are quite happy to come see a patient at any time during the day, even in the night. Um, he's, well, he's, he mentioned that everyone's quite friendly and um, they're quite dedicated to their patients. And so, you shouldn't feel hesitant to teach them. All right, and then just quickly moving on to sort of the second part. Um, so this guy, acute dental pain, febrile, poor dental hygiene, diabetic. This one, I don't think anyone would argue against giving antibiotics to. Um, but then the patient tells you that they are allergic to penicillins. Um, and so... In my experience, at least at LHSC and um, at other emerges, um, depending on how much you like believe the patient, people would still give amoxicillin uh, to this patient. And so I just wanted to talk about why and the numbers and how safe it is to actually do that. Um, so just a sort of general overview of the beta-lactam antibiotics in general. So um, penicillins and cephalosporins, share the, the beta-lactam ring that's highlighted in red here. Um, this is sort of just organic chemistry stuff. Uh, the side chains is what really makes the difference between the two, between penicillin and cephalosporins. Um, and so this is relevant because the actual um, allergenic potential is due to the side chains. I'll talk about that in a bit. And then these are sort of the different antibiotics that we use quite frequently in the eMERGE and in patient. And so this is just for you guys to look at uh, beta-lactam ring here, and then you can see the side chains on the side of the ring are different, just depending on the antibiotic. Um, basically, the general overview, this is a semi-synthetic, uh, good for bacteria with beta-lactamase enzymes, but only specifically penicillinases. And then we usually use amoxicillin, as I was saying, for dental infections, and sometimes combining it with clavulinic acid, um, which is a beta-lactamase inhibitor. And so for, I don't know if this is on anyone's exams in the future, but it's a, it's a suicide inhibitor that binds to the beta-lactamase active, active sites. So basically just outcompetes the, um, the beta-lactamase that the bacteria has. So there'll actually be some amoxicillin left. And same thing with the uh, piperacillin. I never see it not in combination with tazobactam, but sort of the same mechanism. Um, 
competitive uh, inhibitor of the beta lactamase that bacteria has, and then cipricillin, it just has a polar side chain that, that lets it treat um, gram negatives as well. All right, and then this is just sort of a quick overview of the progression of our um, production of cephalosporins. And so um, I have not seen any of the fifth generation cephalosporins yet in the hospitals, and I think we're trying to not have to get to that point. Um, but definitely we're very comfortable using first, second, and third generation cephalosporins in the eMERGE and in hospital. And they basically, as the time goes on, we just get better um, and more broad coverage. Um, and hopefully we don't ever have to go to fifth generation cephalosporins, but that might be quite soon. And then just a quick, quick overview. Everyone's sort of seen this slide before in medical school and probably in multiple allergy presentations, but basically the different types of hypersensitivity reactions. Um, the one that we worry about the most, obviously, is, is the type 1 um, with our medication allergies. And so this includes um, anaphylaxis. Um, usually this is rapid onset. Um, you can get mild urticaria, but then sometimes you can get more severe things like anaphylaxis and angioedema. Um, you know, nausea, vomiting, those systemic symptoms we see with anaphylaxis as well. And so type 1 is the one we're worried about. And the type 4 is probably what we actually see when people say they have a penicillin allergy. And overall, um, there was a large, large study done of 100 million people um, over the course of, you know, 30 years or so who were exposed to oral amoxicillin. And only one death was observed after an, um, an anaphylactic reaction. As I was saying, most of the reactions are just a, del a delayed benign rash. And so people will say, oh, I had a rash everywhere, but no you know, airway compromise, no need for epinephrine. And so these are the patients that I see when I ask them and I talk to staff. They're like, eh, it's not a real allergy. It's probably fine to give it to them anyway. Um, and there is actually literature supporting that thought as well, that true um, IgE immediate allergies are uncommon. This I didn't know about, that allergy, um, like the, someone's allergy to penicillin actually wanes over time. And so if you're a child and you get a real penicillin allergy, you might actually be okay once you're an adult and you should probably get retested at that point. And their conclusion in this study was that, you know, greater than 95% of people can actually tolerate um, a uh, penicillin afterwards, even though they think they have an allergy. And then just a quick slide saying, you know, if we're not gonna use a penicillin because we're concerned about allergies, what are we using instead? And, you know, a lot of these we try to avoid, chloroquinolones especially, uh, carbapenems, I would never want to have to use a carbapenem just because they say it's like a fake allergy to penicillin. Um, and then this is just explaining what we use instead of the penicillin and why we actually should be thinking about whether or not people have a real penicillin allergy or not. Um, and then to touch on why we actually get this cross-reactivity, it's only in 2% of cases and it's only because of the chemical side chains here and not because of the actual beta-lactam ring. And that sort of explains why um, on the next slide I have here, this is probably the only slide you should take away from this if you're going to take away anything. This can be found on the LHSC website as well. Um, I've just highlighted it a little bit to, to show you guys which ones we actually use in the merge a lot. So the way you read this chart is basically if they're in group one, they might actually have a real um, reactivity, cross-reactivity between the two antibiotics in the same group. But if you use different group antibiotics, you should be okay because the rate of cross-reactivity is very, very, very low. And so really the only one that we have to worry about is amoxicillin and cephalexin. And so if someone says they have a true amoxicillin allergy, you shouldn't use, you probably shouldn't use cephalexin, but you can use anything else from the other groups. And I hope that makes sense to everyone. This is probably the only side you need to know. And really, because we don't use the other medications listed here all that much, group two is probably all you care about. And this can be found on the LHSC website. All right. Um, and so just talking about what you would actually uh, prescribe this person. So you get a bit more of a history. They say it in a mild rash at seven years old, didn't need medications like epi and no other symptoms. Is there a way to actually decide whether or not you're going to prescribe this person amoxicillin? Um, 
And so even just based off of the last slide, because it's a uh, amoxicillin exposure, and we, or we are a little bit more careful because they're saying it's the same medication and not a penicillin allergy as a kid. And so to touch on this recently released study um, from Australia, uh, where they tried to make a clinical decision rule, and I don't know, I know people have different thoughts on clinical decision rules, but um, they used a large cohort of patients who were truly anti uh, allergy tested to use as their derivation cohort, and um, they used a different cohort for validation of their rules. Um, they looked at the different antibiotics that I have listed here, and then their cohort of validation included 945 patients. And you can see here that they ended up making this PenFast clinical decision rule to use. Um, obviously, their context may not have been the eMERGE, but I think it might be something we think about um, because the allergists are now using this, according to Dr. Jamie, that I talked to, and they find it quite helpful. Obviously, they can do real allergy testing after that, but at least in the eMERGE, if someone scores, you know, a zero, then their risk of a penicillin allergy is very, very low. And then if you combine that with the um, cross-reactivity table, I think we should feel more reassured that um, the practice that we're already doing about giving people amoxicillin anyway, if they have a quote, quote unquote penicillin allergy, it is a little bit more um, like we're able to use numbers and actually say that, hey, your risk is actually very, very low of you having a reaction. I'm pretty sure this is on NDCalc already too, if, someone, um, if you guys are keen on using apps. And then I just wanted to touch on their negative predictive value uh, when using this tool in the validation cohort. So it's actually quite good. Um, majority over 90%, this one just a little bit lower than that, but uh, their numbers using the rule um, make me feel at least quite safe saying that if someone you know is a zero or a one it's probably unlikely that they have a true reaction um, so the only thing to keep in mind with this rule is that they did not include patients with non-penicillin allergies so um, you can't use it for a cephalosporin unfortunately so just keeping that in mind and as i mentioned knowing the our, our side groups and combining this rule I think will be helpful in the eMERGE to just confirm what we're already doing with giving people these prescriptions anyway. Sorry, I'm just trying to keep in mind the time I'm almost done here. Um, so sort of just the three objectives that we talked about earlier in the presentation. So a uh, approach to ontogenic infections, talking about the cross-reactivity of uh, penicillins and cephalosporins, and then talking about a clinical decision-making role to use. And the take-home points here are no rule. If we're going to go completely, um, you know, by the book, exam answer, like there, does, there doesn't seem to necessarily be a role for antibiotics in these ontogenic infections, but obviously you have to take into context all the other factors we were talking about earlier in the presentation. But I think at least, you know, if I had an infection and I could see my dentist the next day and I'm just in pain, I don't necessarily need a prescription for amoxicillin unless I say I'm too busy to go to the dentist for a week and can I please have a prescription to tide me over until then. Um, can consider doing a delayed antibiotic prescription like we're already doing as I mentioned for AOM and um, sometimes for pharyngitis but instead of I guess I just wanted to say like instead of defaulting giving everyone antibiotics just to pause for a second and think do we actually need it and then talking about penicillin allergies, just confirming what we've already been doing um, and making sure that uh, someone with a amoxicillin and cephalexin that we actually are more careful about their cross-reactivity as well. So that one table that you can find online just it's probably the biggest takeaway from this presentation as well. All right, and then this is just the uh, list of references that I have at the end here. All right, and uh, I don't know if there are any questions or discussion points that anyone wanted to bring up. Thanks, Kelly. That was uh, very enlightening and educational and informative. Um, I wonder how many of our ED you know, uh, visitors actually have access to dental care 
um, which is often the reason that they're in emerge in the first place is because they don't have dentists or cannot see dentists or cannot afford dental care. And in your experience in doing this uh, um, talk, do you feel that might factor into use of antibiotics for these patients? Um, so, I mean, I think uh, if you talk to the patient, they can probably tell you, you know, like the, you know, the well-off 30-year-old who has a job, who can see a dentist the next day. Um, if you just spend like the extra minute asking about the social history, uh, I think you could be able to tease that out. Um, and like asking them to be honest, if they say they won't, like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll see the dentist tomorrow. But you actually ask them to, to tell you the truth and like, no, actually, it's going to be a few days, then um, I think we just have to spend more time talking to people and getting the actual story out of it. And I agree, like, especially at Vic, um, I find that a lot of the patients probably are not able to uh, get to a dentist. And I think when I was talking to Jeff again, um, he did say you can refer them to the, um, their dental clinic and they can get seen for cheaper. Uh, Kelly, it's Laura Price. Um, I just had a comment that it seems to be, and maybe this is just a rumor, that um, a lot of dentists will not actually do dental extractions or procedures if there's any potential infection unless they've already had at least several days of oral antibiotics. This is what's been sort of reported to me by patients over the years. And I don't really know if that's true or not, but it has been sort of a source of frustration by us just that we tend to think of generally abscesses as needing drainage more than needing antibiotics. And I just wondered if you could comment on that. Yeah, and yeah, that's another thing that Jeff and I talked about. Um, just because, as I was saying earlier, like the, the dental association itself um, needs to sort of make that change. And as I was mentioning, he did say that a lot of dentists will just prescribe amoxicillin uh, like willy nilly and give it to most people. And they need to start making changes themselves and not give them antibiotics if they don't need to. Um, but he agreed, like it just, and maybe it's because he is the MD training of being OMFS that he would just take it out and not even bother with antibiotics. So I think they need to make their own push and sort of after talking to him, um, we sort of uh, were thinking of ways to like promote that as well with their dental school, but I don't know how easy that is to do because it's just like medicine where people are so used to doing one thing and then um, not changing their practice. And so I think it requires cooperation between the two medical professions, unfortunately. And I would also just echo Munsif's comment that to a lot, a lot of our patients will just frankly tell me, that's nice that you're telling me that I have to see a dentist, but that's just not something that I have the funds for. And in the past, when I've had antibiotics for this, it makes it better for a while. So I'll take whatever I can get. Yeah, and so that was sort of, uh, if I flip back to, let me just find that slide again. Um, yeah, so Jeff's like expert opinion here. And so like again, this is like a very academic talk, like the literature-based whatever thing to do is to not give antibiotics, but obviously real life is way, way different. Um, so according to their practice, they do find that they can tie patients over if they get the antibiotic prescription at least for a few weeks actually to, until they can see them. Um, so I definitely see why the patients are saying that because even the experts are saying that it does seem to tie people over. Um, so I think, you know, it, it depends on how fast they can see the dentist. And so in your example, if they're gonna be weeks, like I probably would consider giving them the antibiotics as long as they know about all the side effects and that they eventually their tooth will need to come out if, um, like, eventually at some point anyway. As long as they understand it's not a cure for it, I think it's reasonable. The, the reality is that uh, dental care continues to be quite expensive um, for people without drug plans. Um, and although it may be more accessible than, you know, seeing your family doctor, 
um, there are many barriers to dental care in the community, both in terms of cost, convenience, um, as well as practice patterns. So I feel like often we are going to get pressured into giving these people antibiotics while they're working out the logistics of getting dental care. I had a comment about the uh, second case. The other thing about that young man with the fever and the dental infection, especially with that picture that you showed, I'd be wanting to rule out a Ludwig's angina in the emergency department before uh, sending him home. Um, that's one of the life-threatening complications of an endodontic infection. So wondered if you had any comments on that. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, <laughs> I haven't seen a case myself, but obviously it's something we are supposed to have on our differential as well. Um, Jeff uh, had said that he'd seen maybe three or four cases of it. And like he was saying, like, as soon as you're concerned at all, um, you can either call them or ENT, which I didn't know about. I think most people would have just called ENT, but they're actually open to seeing these patients as well. And they can admit them if you needed them to take care of them. Yes, that's been, been my experience as well. Um, they're, they're more than happy to come and see them. Now, it can be an airway emergency, so be cautious with how aggressive you are trying to uh, look at their, uh, their mouth and airway. If they've got a lot of trismus, don't push on the tongue and uh, spread the infection into their mediastinum. <laughs> but yes, yeah. I've uh, had seen about three cases, and uh, most of them are fairly obvious and uh, end up going to the OR emergently with a double setup for uh, for ENT or OMFS. Uh, for the ones that aren't as obvious, Roy, do you, is your practice to uh, look, look into some imaging uh, in, in these situations and what, uh, what imaging, I, I tend to CT some of these, uh, is that what you do, Roy? If I see that they, um, when I look in their mouth, that they have a woody or a, a very firm floor of the mouth, I, I get consults right away. I wouldn't send them to the CT because they can deteriorate quickly. I, I'd have them in a resuscitation area where you can deal with things. If it's more subtle, then yes, CT I would do and, and then consult if need be, but be very cautious of uh, sending the more uh, uh, sick patient to the CT without getting somebody else on board right away. But yes, CT I would do in the questionable cases. And, and the subtle ones can surprise you as well. Uh, I remember uh, uh, seating a patient and uh, finding out they had epiglottitis, um, which, which wasn't the, 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 the wisest thing to do at the, uh, in retrospect, but uh, it presented in a very subtle way. So uh, sometimes the subtle one, ones can, uh, can surprise you. So uh, ENT and uh, odontogenic infections uh, deserve some respect. Um, at times. Are there other questions for Kelly? That was a great uh, presentation, Kelly, with a good discussion afterwards. Um, There's some comments in the, in the chat forum as well. Um, Julie has mentioned a couple of things about the UWO dentistry um, clinic, the, not, not the UH one, but the one actually at Western, which is, uh, which is a, an alternative, sort of a cheaper alternative to dental care and is uh, quite affordable as well. The OMF uh, residents also see facial uh, plastics type of stuff. So if you're having trouble reaching plastics sometimes, then uh, they're happy to see these as well. And a number, a number of their staff do uh, facial trauma as well. So just something else to keep in mind. I just have one systems kind of question. Um, Kelly, did the dental resident um, give you any insight onto how off or how soon after a referral is made that these patients are going to be seen um, in their clinic and how that referral is actually placed? Um, I don't know if it's just the patients that I've seen. I've just never referred without uh, talking to the, the dental residents. So would they want us to be calling or is this just a general referral, just like anything else that we can actually put in? So Patrice, I can speak to that. Um, if you look on Fred, 
Um, dentistry has given us new referral guidelines during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and the guidelines are, are in that document. So during, uh, during business hours, they still prefer that we call and discuss even simple cases with the dental resident, but overnight uh, there is a fax number and they usually call the patient directly the next day. Yeah, Jeff said it was pretty quick. Um, if it's uh, like an overnight thing, maybe he said like maybe the next two, three days we'll get back to them and um, they triage it. If you are super concerned, you can um, write on the fax that it's urgent and they'll triage them even quick, more quickly. Our dental colleagues um, and OMF colleagues have been very, very supportive and very collegial in their um, approach and uh, dealings with the emergency department. Um, so I, I never hesitate uh, uh, to call and discuss cases with them uh, that I feel fall into their domain. And um, I've only had great experiences with that service. Thank you, Kelly. I don't think there's any uh, other questions. Um, good luck for the rest of the year with Grand Rounds and a big thank you to Kelly for putting this together uh, with uh, great visual slides um, and uh, a lot of good discussion. And hopefully we'll have uh, exciting Grand Rounds to come in the uh, next uh, year. We're remaining on Zoom for uh, the foreseeable future. So hope the format works for everyone. And thanks to everyone uh, who joined and a big thanks to Kelly as well. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks everyone.